this is going to be focused on readability strategies. Um, so I'm focusing it on technical writing, but this applies, of course, to all writing. And as we say, the more complex your writing is, actually, the easier you need to make. The more complex the topic, the easier needs to be the writing. So the first point that is sometimes difficult to get across to writers that are just new in industry is that you didn't communicate just by putting words on the page. That doesn't mean you've done the job. You only know you've done the job if the person you're trying to communicate with understands your message. Um, so there can be a lot of things that inhibit communication that people aren't aware of right when they first start writing. Um, so for example, on this page, when you see green, you get the idea that that's go. And when you see red, you get the idea that that's stop. So I've used it appropriately here. I said, you haven't communicated. I put that in red. Receive and understand is in green. Well, if you saw a document and it was supposed to be telling people something they should do, but that was in red, you would be subliminally sending off a message that they shouldn't do it. Um, these things may seem tiny, but they can actually have a bigger impact than you think, especially if it's a very important document like a safety document or um, a procedure that people have to follow. Um, with the internet and with people becoming more and more visual, uh, we also see a lot of icons and diagrams and shapes that communicate various messages. And it's important to be aware of those. Um, that's not to say that we're all gonna run out and use icons. My main icon is this friendly mouse here. Um, but you should be aware of them and, and be alert to them in your documentation and find out, be curious about your documents rather than just following lockstep what you're given. Although my general advice is that it's good to follow if you're working with a company and they've got templates. Um, usually the corporate designers are really do know what they're doing, but still be curious about how you present things. Um, so this is a little rundown on what we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to talk about the reader, which is the number one um, thing really as a writer. Um, second is how to use words basic thing is to reduce them for readability. Uh, third, we're going to talk about space on the page. And there, the main lesson is add white space. If you talk to any designer, they will always talk about white space. It makes the understanding happens in the space between the words. You could write that down if you have a pen and paper with you. The understanding happens in the space between the words. You know, people begin and they think they have to put down lots of technical words to help people understand. Really, you just need to figure out the few words that you need to put in between the space, which may be a different shift in thinking for you. Um, how to use diagrams and images. Of course, if you can use a diagram instead of a whole bunch of paragraphs, that's fantastic for communication. So part one, let's really meet the reader. So when we're thinking about the reader, um, so let's say you're sending a grant proposal to a client or a proposal to a client. Um, you need to think about their education level, their purpose, their motivation, their circumstances, and their distractions and their usual reading habits. So if you're sending your if you're a very technical person and you've got some amazing technology, but you're sending it to a client who only needs to use your technology and not necessarily understand your technology, then it's important to bring your language to their level. Um, they're not motivated to understand all the engineering behind the technology necessarily. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit more. Let's look at these readers, for example. So let's start with the oldest picture here um, in the top right. Hildegard von Bingen is an amazing woman who lived around the 11th century. And she was respected all over Europe political leaders even listened to her. Of course, a woman in that time, that's impressive. She was an abbess, um, so highly intelligent. However, she also ran an abbey. So she's going to be distracted by, um, you know, all these other people coming and saying, what should we do in the garden today? And what should we handle with this? And um, so think about that. When you're sending her a letter, she's going to be distracted by various people. If we compare that with the three monks that are not sitting on the throne. so. The guy in authority is giving these three guys, we could think of these as maybe the young engineers, right? Here's your task for the day. Go away into the quiet garden and study this task and do this reading and do this writing. 
a quiet task, they should be able to read quite complicated material because they have time, they have energy, they have quiet. Um, compare that with, you know, the modern scenarios that we see here. So one, we see the guy that's exhausted and we can just imagine all the distractions, right? The phone's ringing in his face. He's got emails. He's got music playing in his earbuds. He's got other people. It's exhausting to be in that kind of environment. And you can imagine that in that top left environment, you can't read long documents in that environment. So the average sentence length on a web page or on a typical news article nowadays is eight words. And just take a guess and write it on your piece of paper. How many words do you think were typical in for Hildegard von Bingen, what she was reading? Um, so I'm gonna take this from Chaucer from the 13th century. How many words do you think was in a Chaucerian sentence? Take a guess. The answer is 82. So more than 10 times as words as we have now. Of course, it was 10 times as quiet as well. So I may be belaboring a point that doesn't seem relevant, but it is relevant because you need to think about who are you sending this document to and are they in the monk-like silence or are they dealing with a ton of distractions? So let's run this down. Again, if you've got your pen and paper, it would be great. I just want you to take a minute and try to fill in this table. Actually take your pen and paper and just sketch it down. I know you don't have the table on your page, but give it a shot. I'll just give you a minute and then I will talk about the answers. Okay, so we already kind of talked about the monk. We know this is CAD fail off the TV show. Education level probably very high and also very specific to their task. So they're not flailing about for what to do. They know what they're doing. Their purpose is very precise and very clear and they're being paid or fed for what they're doing. They're motivated probably just by a rise in hierarchy and doing a good job. Um, very few distractions as we mentioned and they're in the habit of reading this type of document. Now let's switch to an internet user and many watchers of this uh, presentation have noted that internet user is really vague. Um, we don't know what the education level is. So th this is important because let's say that you put an environmental report out on the internet. Okay, it's not only going to be read by your colleagues who are also environmental scientists, it's going to be read by the public, it's going to be read by possibly government, it may be read by international sources, uh, it may be read by students. So you need to think about not necessarily addressing those readers. I mean, you have your purpose as well, but you do need to be aware about who's in the room. Um, so the purpose, so if you're writing a web page, you wanna reach people, what is the purpose that they have coming to your web page? You need to be aware of that. And how motivated are they to stay on your web page? Um, you know, that's for you to figure out. And there are a lot of tricks for web pages to keep people on your web page. Um, but you also need to be aware with technical reports that people may not be motivated to read through all 80 pages of your report. So you need to make it more appealing and easier to digest. So that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, you don't know the reading habits and the distractions of the internet read user either. So it's just good to be aware of these things. So here's a quiz for you. We talked about Hildegard von Bingen. Now take this to an office tower. So say in Calgary, when I worked at Golder, you could see downtown and you could see the people in the office towers of the oil companies. And I, I noticed a lot of things when I was working in downtown Calgary about what happens with the people at the top of the oil towers and the people that are in the middle levels. So take your pen and paper and try to rank these, who's the best reader in this list, who's the worst reader in this list. Just going to give you a minute and then I'll tell you the answers. Krista, there's one question in the chat about how you define uh, reader ability. Um, 
reader ability or read ability? The reader's abilities. The reader's abilities. So that's, we'll talk about that more in this quiz answer. So the reader's abilities, basically it's saying, is the reader able to read what you're putting out there? So in the case of if you put an environmental report on the internet, um, the people that approach it might understand everything that you say, and there might be other people that approach it who could misinterpret what you say, um, depending on their reading level. So there's a guy from the government who did a talk at a conference I was at maybe 10 or 12 years ago, and it was called the complexity of literacy tasks. And what he was talking about was a lot of the senior citizens in Canada don't have the reading ability to read the tax forms because actually doing the tax forms, I mean, it's getting easier now with the internet, but is extremely complex because you have to go from various boxes and flip various pages to fill in the tasks that you're asked to do on the tax form. And so his job in the government was to think about how can we take this to a lower reading level, a lower complexity level. Um, so that's a long sort of explanation of reader ability, but we could talk more about that later. Um, so for this quiz, a lot of people may have assumed that the CEO was the best reader, not at all the case. Um, the reason the CEO is not the best reader is that the CEO has a lot on their mind. So I have seen CEOs flip out at the very tiniest things in formatting that they just want it to be really perfect before they'll read it. Um, so you need to keep in mind that the reason we have executive summaries is because CEOs don't read 80 page reports. They read the precy of the report or they have, for example, the middle people, maybe the middle manager or the, the vice presidents who read all the reports and then they tell the CEO what's in the report. Um, the new engineer fresh out of university is probably fantastic at reading university papers but they don't have a benefit that D and E have, which is D and E are practiced with reading the kind of papers that they're seeing at work. So they've become quicker at it because they know what to look for in every document that crosses their desk. They know how to approach it. The engineer might be a great reader, but they need to learn how to read that fresh kind of resource. And the janitor is the wild card here. Um, it can be really easy to assume the janitor is not a good reader, but a lot of janitors are actually immigrants who have extremely high education levels and might know a lot. So it's just a reminder not to assume. And do we have another question we should take there, Marnie, or is it just a comment? No, I was just admitting somebody else into the meeting and Perfect. there's no other questions. Great. Okay, so the first takeaway from this section is think of the reader and give that reader what they need. And granted, maybe you only need to think about the specific reader that is your target audience, but we need to dig into who they actually are. Okay, so now we're gonna look at an email um, to Eric. Um, so Perry has been complaining around the office that Eric never responds with the answers he needs. So you're trying to do work with this client, the client's not getting back. I've heard this lots of times when I was working in industry. Okay, let's find out why. So here's the email that Perry wrote. Okay, Eric, I need answers for you before I can proceed. What's the capacity of the storage tank we discussed? Have you booked the transport truck and trailer? Please confirm there's accommodations available. Okay, so that's three requests. It's not that complicated. However, if Perry is a busy guy, then he sees just a block of text and it's very common in business that he might just answer the first question or maybe he'll just answer the last question. And you could say he should do better, but he's the client, you should do better. So the reason that we wanna write better is so that the reader doesn't have to work as hard. So let's think about how we could improve this email. Okay, so the first thing is organization would help. And again, we are gonna do some work here so that the reader doesn't have to do the work. So, First of all, and often we have all made mistakes about not changing the subject header in an email thread. We want to change that subject header, okay? Second thing, very important for colleague relations, say hello, say please, and say thank you. Don't just put Eric like he did at the beginning, okay? Third thing, say how many answers we actually need. So now we say, please see below, I need three answers from you before I can proceed. So in this case, Perry is explaining that when Eric doesn't give the answers, 
we aren't getting, we can't proceed with the project. This is a real issue. Okay, then he gives a deadline, please respond by Monday, August 4th. It's really handy to give a deadline and usually only two or three days in the future. If you make the deadline too far, people just shove it aside and forget about it. Okay, so then one, two, three, it's really obvious that we need three answers. It's really easy to give one, two, three answers. Okay, and then final point is do not assume that people have you on speed dial or that people have your email just saved. Give your contact details to make it easier. Again, we're making it easier for the reader. It might be more time for us, but it's worth it, especially when they're the client. How to use words. So how you use words is going to depend on your audience, as we already said. However, certain measures help at most levels. So the first thing I do is add more paragraph breaks. I often receive papers that sometimes have a half a page as one paragraph. And people were told by their high school teachers that they needed to put all the ideas together. And so they do that. We need to think about that. You've gone beyond your high school math. So it's also important to go beyond the high school English teacher lessons. Um, same thing. Uh, second measure that helps almost all the time is to shorten the sentences. So split sentences into two when possible and get rid of extra words and use simpler and more elegant words. So we're gonna talk more about that here. So the first thing is to use fewer words. And so I'm going to address something that we learned in high school, which is, or you might've learned it in Toastmasters. So if you're making a speech, you make your point and then you repeat your point. And when you give the conclusion, then you say your point again. So that's fantastic if you're in marketing, if it's a persuasive essay for high school, if it's a speech for Toastmasters or for poetry. Um, and while I was actually making this webinar, I came across the most beautiful sentence I think I have ever read uh, in the New York Times. This is about a terrible incident in Nigeria, but in the sentence center there, they say, the protests were peaceful, insistently peaceful, consistently peaceful. And because it's in such a violent article, even though this sentence is buried in the middle of dense paragraphs, that repetition is completely appropriate. I don't think you're gonna see this situation in a technical report, okay? Normally repetition is just gonna bog us down. So let's talk about technical reports. Uh, step one, use fewer words. In technical writing, don't repeat yourself and don't be redundant. Okay, so instead of repeating ourselves, and so particularly the place that I see repetition happen is introduction, conclusion, and executive summary. I have sometimes seen copy and pasted. That's not the ideal way to do it. Instead, make it clean and clear. Every piece in your report should have a really clear purpose and there shouldn't be any copy and pasting. And we use headings to mark important ideas really well. So our table of contents acts like a roadmap and the headings are the X marks, the spot for various things. If you put your data into tables, it's really easy to find. Uh, people can look at tables and at a glance, they can process what information you've put in the tables. Um, so, and I'm going to make a special note here that, again, this is a holdover from high school, is that your high school teachers say to use creative words and to use descriptive words and to use interesting words. But when you're doing a technical report, and this becomes a legal issue as well, you really need to use the same word to mean the same thing. And that even goes down to capitalization. So if it's a storage tank, you need to call it a storage tank all the time. Don't change the capitalization. Don't think up cute words for it. Just use the same one, even if that seems boring. Um, another thing that I often see uh, in English second language particularly is um, people sometimes say the latter instead of just repeating what they said in the last sentence. It's better in technical reports to just repeat what you said, because sometimes if you use it or them or the latter and these replacement words, it can be complicated to actually identify what you were talking about. So in that case, we do want to repeat. So the top objective is clarity and easiness. Your reader should not have to stop and go back to the last sentence to figure out what you're talking about. So you don't want to use too many words, but you also don't want to use too few words. 
Next strategy for fewer words is to delete trash words. <laughs> and when I ran through this with some fellow editors, they made a sound of delight at this because when we receive papers, we often pick some of these trash phrases and just put them in the search window. Um, when you see it is noteworthy of mention, it, it's often not that noteworthy and it can be deleted or in fact and indeed. Now, sometimes therefore and however do have a logical purpose in an argument, but a lot of times they're just sort of sprinkled in and they don't need to be there. So extra fat in technical writing usually does not aid understanding. So usually we wanna get rid of trash words. And there's lists and lists of these. I have some blog posts about them. I can share later if you're interested, just let us know. Another thing that we have lists and lists of, sorry, my table is a bit foggy here, but um, lists and lists of wordy language. Um, so some editors that I know actually have macros to replace if, if we're editing massive reports, um, these kind of phrases. So instead of saying a decreased amount of something, we can just say we have less of something. Um, instead of saying alternative choices, we can just say choices. And again, there's pages and pages of these, um, I would say they're verbal ticks. And you know, if you're standing around talking to people, it can be perfectly fine to use these kind of phrases. But if you're trying to write reports and, and memos and things that are more readable, then it's much better to trim the fat and to use the concise language on the right hand side there. Step two, do we have any questions about concise words? It'd be good to carry on. Thanks, Krista. No, just uh, just a comment that it can also read like legalese. <laughs> so it's a good comment. And yeah. uh, a request for the link to the blog post. So uh, what I can do is in the follow-up email, we can share these slides and our webinar recording as well as links that would be useful for everybody from today. Perfect, we'll do that. Okay, so now let's talk about elegant words. So as in fashion, elegant is simple. We don't want lots of fluffs and ruffles in our writing. So to impress high school and university teachers, we got in the habit of using the biggest, most complex words. To impress clients, keep it simple. So the way to make your client think that you are really smart is to actually make them feel really smart. And the way that they will feel really smart is if they never have to guess about your acronyms. If you've used a word that's big and long, don't make them go to the internet, just explain it. Then it's not jargon. Take long words and deflate them to short words, okay? We're gonna give some examples of this. Um, so here's some examples of popping these word balloons. So deflating the long word or reverbing the noun, as we say, often helps eliminate other words in the sentence. So here's an example. We performed an analysis of the sample. So actually we mean we analyzed the sample, but what the writer did here is they took analyze the verb and they changed it to a noun, analysis, and then you have to add an extra verb performed an analysis. So you can often sometimes see this um, because in French, we often say that we made something or we did something, but in English, we don't need that extra verb. We just wanna use straight clean languages as, as, as much as we can, okay? Another example is we studied the extent of the utilization of the building throughout the summer months. Okay, so Utilization is the clue there. And I do actually also when editing often go and hunt for ization. Because if I see these phrases that you see on the right, Asian, eyes, able, eight, ization, they're often in clunky sentences. So we could just take that utilization and make it use. And we could study the extent of the building summer use. And actually that last sentence can be even more interesting we could just say we studied the building's summer use patterns. And the word patterns gives us an even better idea of what we were studying, if that's appropriate in the context, which it was here. Um, another clue that appears in both of these sentences and that I often also go looking for is of the. So you can see that we don't need of the when we've reduced these sentences from fat to thin. Um, here's some other examples of you. So you can see on the left hand side, they have those, those endings that I talked about. 
and on the right hand side, you can see a more elegant word. So methodology is method and modification is change and enumerate could just be list. Um, usually you don't need to say enumerate. It's a cool word and other scientists and, and mathematicians might enjoy it, but think about who your audience is and if they're going to enjoy the word enumerate or not. Um, another point about methodology and method is that a method is a method. A methodology is a collection of methods. So I often see writers put methodology when they actually only mean method. So it's important to make that distinction and not actually use wrong words just to sound bigger. Was that a question? No. no? Um, okay, step three, use the active voice. So the active voice uses fewer words. Uh, the extra words needed for the passive voice often make longer, harder to read sentences like this one. Uh, the active voice also tells us who is doing the thing, which also inspires reader confidence and client confidence. So if you're sending reports out to your clients that are constantly saying, um, you know, the data was collected, or the field work was done, that is not as confidence inspiring as if you say we collected the data and we did the field work. It's much more confidence inspiring. So active voice and shortening words, actually these two strategies work together, okay? So the conclusion was reached. When we change that to be active, we get we concluded. So you see, we also got rid of the extra verb that way. Um, so just some other examples, rationalization, rationale can become reason. But I know I'm harping on the same point here, but when you untangle it, you also can shorten the words and active voice helps you do that. So here's another little quiz. And if you take out your pen and paper and give this a try, or just do these in your head, I did the first one for you. So if you look at number two on the left, your contribution to the church lunch was appreciated. Hmm. You can imagine a church secretary sitting down and writing 20 exact identical cards of thank you saying that exact phrase. It's uh, use it for everybody, right? Not very personal. You could change it to thank you for bringing cookies to the church lunch. And then it would be even more relationship building if you said, I noticed the ladies table particularly gobbled them up with great delight. So you're showing appreciation for the person who's receiving this. Okay, so number one, your check will be mailed by the accountant. We wanna take the actor and just say, the accountant will mail the check. Number three, the budget has been approved by the client. We would just say the client has approved the budget. And number four has an extra problem. We don't know who's doing this, okay? So we'll change it to we will do the field work or our team will do the field work or our subcontractor will do the field work and name them. So you can see the accountable, the active voice is it's also the accountable voice and that's the trust building voice and you want to build trust with the people that you're, re you're writing to. Design tricks. Does it work? It does work. So the point of this slide is just that there's a lot that's known about design and how the eye travels on the page. So how on earth is this readable? This is a newspaper from 1919 and um, it's readable. Like look how many words are on that page. So here's the strategies that they use. The headings are extremely clear. You can easily read all the headings and then you decide which small print you wanna read, right? There's a surprising amount of white space created here. Um, just in the carriage returns and just in those little lines. So when you think of newspapers, um, a lot of those paragraphs are only one sentence and then you hit a return after because it makes it more readable. It uses readable proper fonts. Uh, the information is in a predictable place, which is also very important in reports, marketing and any kind of writing. And the columns are narrow. So you can imagine if you had any one of these articles and it went from the left-hand side right to the right-hand side, it would be very difficult to read. 
And so usually in most corporate templates, the margins are set on purpose for readability. So when people go and stretch the margins in grant proposals because they think they can max out the space on the five pages, that's a very bad idea because you're creating a hard to read document, which is never good if you're asking for money. Um, so when you look at this paragraph, how many things are you asked to do here? What you do is you have to start reading the paragraph, right? Let's drag. But what if we do this? Easy, four things. I'm asking for four things. So as you get organized, go back and make sure each sentence contains one idea. The important ideas are at the front and back of paragraphs. Parallel ideas show up in bulleted lists and like ideas are grouped together. Diagrams and images. So this is kind of the piece de resistance. If you can change words into diagrams, that makes you an A plus reporter, really. So think visual. Good places for pictures instead of paragraphs explaining new technologies, a map or a diagram, procedures, and especially safety procedures, and relationships between people, obviously org charts that we're used to seeing. So here's an example from a Synovus um, site. And you can imagine if you just had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven paragraphs on a blank white piece of paper, it would be incredibly boring. Who wants to read, we drill two horizontal wells, one above the other, deep underground? Not interesting, but when it's attached to an image, oh, your eye starts to follow along. What's happening at number one? You get curious. Oh, they're drilling wells. Then, hmm, what's happening at number two? What do those icons mean? And then you've got a little paragraph there. So by using this image, curiosity is naturally created and everybody wants to see what's going on. It's cool. Um, a lot of places people can do this, they don't do it. They just type one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and they never think to make an image. So if you go home with one take home for today, I would love it if you go back to a document that you wrote and see how you can make it more engaging with an image. So here's another example that you don't have to read this. I'm leaving the text up here for the recording. But basically, uh, I was working with a water treatment engineer and her clients had asked her to um, describe a number of different technologies and they wanted to know a number of different factors about these technologies. So if we had made this into a report, it would have been at least 20 pages, you know, the table of contents you can imagine would have the same headings for every single technology, the pricing, environmental impact, staffing, operational factors. It would have been a big, not very engaging work. Okay, so what we did instead is we made a chart. So instead of a table of contents and 20 pages of writing, we took the pricing, the environmental factors, the staffing, the operational needs, and then we compared the five technologies across the top. And anything that needed more information, so the environmental factors of D, we would make a three-point summary of what those were. And then for any further information that we need, we could say go to Appendix D. And then all that information for somebody would further be there. But how much more cool is it to take a diagram to the client and say, here's a diagram. It's got all the information that you asked me for. And then you can put it up on a screen and have a good long discussion. And I think that that is my last slide, except for here is the summary, the grand summary. So the magic list, first of all, is it fitting the reader's purpose? Um, if I'm sent documents that I have to edit in a hurry and try to make more readable in a hurry, the first thing I do is hit paragraph returns. And I didn't discuss that very much in this presentation. Um, but um, the next one is to break up sentences. So hit paragraph returns. Again, those half page paragraphs are not a good way to communicate. Um, long sentences that we can make into short ones by um, getting rid of semicolons, getting rid of the word and is helpful. Bulleted lists are just gold whenever you have parallel information. Um, adding white space in any other way that you can. So narrower columns, um, bulleted lists introduce white space already. Um, reducing the trash words, replacing the long words and creating diagrams, which is the piece de resistance. 
And so now, do we have questions? The first question that we okay. had was um, that this presentation appears to be similar to an old Precy's writing processes where we reduce messages by 40% while maintaining their meaning. Um, what is the new terminology for Precy's? I need to send this to my, my staff to these courses. <laughs> Well, that's great to hear. Um, so Precy, I think Precy is still a Precy, but we normally I think executive summary is a Precy or just summary, I guess people would call it like a one page summary. But executive summary is usually the section of a report that's at the front now that should, um, yeah, be the short version. There was one comment about passive voice, uh, just comment that it's okay to use passive it's, voice if it's not important or not known who or what performed the action. True, I would say uh, sometimes we don't know. And of course, in legal context, they love to use the passive voice because you can avoid owning the responsibility then. Um, but I would question whether it's important. I, th I think it's often, it's still nice to take accountability when you can, unless you're trying to not. All right, and the next question is, a justified paragraphs. Okay, so yes. should I just read them out and, and answer? Yes. <laughs> so what's your opinion on justified paragraphs? Um, so actually, I believe the readability scientists say that justified paragraphs, which means the ones that go all the way from margin to margin are actually less readable. And the reason that they're less readable is that when we justify the paragraphs, the word processing software um, naturally add space after the periods. And what this can end up doing is um, making rivers of space in the documents. And so that's why it's less readable. So there are a lot of studies um, out there that we could find if we Googled that um, paragraphs that are ragged right, so just aligned on the left are actually easier to read. Sorry if that's a disappointment. <laughs> What type of words are appropriate to refer to the thesaurus to avoid use of the same word? Um, so in technical writing, I we, especially when you're identifying things, you know, like I talked about a storage tank or something, you really want to use the same word. So in technical writing, you should not be referring to the thesaurus very much at all, um, I think. And do we comply with complain language when composing technical documents? Absolutely. Whenever you can use plain language instead of complex language, that is an excellent strategy to do and strongly in favor of that. Um, thank you very much. You're welcome very much. Thanks for coming. Um, my team is hesitant to use we did in technical writing because in university we were told to never write in the first person. So yes. Um, and I will say that in academic journals, this is a trend that is changing. So some of, some of the British based journals, scientific journals still do insist on passive voice and on not using we. However, there's an increasing amount of particularly academic journals who do allow people to use we and do prefer that people use the active voice instead of the passive voice because of course the passive voice is less plain language and passive voice is not plain language really um it's more difficult to read and it denies accountability um so the reason to use we did is because it gains you that trust so you may be able to sell your team on that that said, I know there's been a long, decades long tradition of it sounds more academic to use the passive voice. People think that. Um, and some people, we aren't going to change their minds. Um, but generally, another thing that I've heard senior people say is that when somebody really, really knows their stuff, they don't hesitate to say, I did this, or I think this, or we did this. Um, and they write much more clearly. And it's often when people don't know things very well that the language is more circuitous and more passive voices used. So people just kind of hedge around. Um, may you see the last slide again? Well, we will send you the slides on the email. So that will answer that one. Um, Krista, you mentioned using color early in your presentation. Do you need to consider accessibility? Oh yes, that's a good question. Are there times when other strategies would work better for emphasizing text? Uh, the short answer is yes, um, absolutely. So certain colors, for example, orange on a white background 
is terrible because some people don't see very well and especially on a screen although you know luckily there's accessibility apps and i have one on my computer now called um, iris which makes things easier to read um, but accessibility of fonts and colors is a whole nother topic and an excellent topic, uh, which I don't really have time to get into right now. Um, other strategies for emphasizing text would be bold, of course, or italics sometimes. Um, for writing manuals and instructions, yes. Um, in fact, I think one of our future webinars um, is going to be on writing manuals and instructions. And we have we have some courses coming up, but they're not re they're not ready yet. <laughs> and that is that will be one of them. Um, and that one says privately, so I'm not going to read it out loud. Um, what are your thoughts on writing methods using passive voice when the reader already understands who did the work? Some journals insist on that, and I prefer to act, to change it to active voice when I'm able to. Other journals, you just again, that's an academic journal question. Um, and oh, that's the last question so far. Um, so yeah, my thought on writing methods in passive voice is I prefer active because it's more plain language, but some journals won't permit that. Mm -hmm. About the use of the turn, sure. the undersigned did something. Um, you can use the term the undersigned did something, I suppose. It's a little bit circuitous and it's not plain language, but it's not incorrect. Before everybody uh, has to sign off, I will just jump in and remind everybody the next webinar is on the second Wednesday of January, which is the 13th, and that is uh, persuasive writing. Um, again, if you want to be notified of these events, you can just email me. Here's my email address on here again, Marnie Turek at UBCA with a dot between Marnie and Turek. Um, we'd love to hear uh, your ideas as well of what you want to learn about. Um, what's important. Yes, absolutely. Yes, I, I figured you'd be excited about that part, Krista, too. So uh, <laughs> please feel free to share that kind of information. And um, if you follow us on that Eventbrite site, uh, you will get notified of the upcoming events as well. Um, before everybody does leave, I do want to say thank you to you, Krista, for an excellent presentation. And uh, this is our first in our series, and we're really looking forward to having you present the next four in the series through till April. Um, Please, everybody, feel free to share this with your networks. These series are free, and we want to reach as many people who are interested in these topics as possible. Um, I really enjoyed seeing this. I enjoyed seeing such a great turnout today. And we are definitely looking forward to seeing everybody again. And as I mentioned, hearing your feedback uh, on what, you, what you're looking forward to and what you want to talk about. Um, so we will be here for the next little bit. If anyone wants to um, ask questions directly, you have to sign off. Thank you very much for joining. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again. If you can stay, you can also um, just speak through the Zoom platform and un unmute yourself and ask questions directly and put your video on as we yes. have less people um, in the crowd. It's, it's easier to do that. So we would love to, uh, to be able to, to stay and, and chat with you some more. So please feel free to do so.